Welcome to It's Complicated, a conversation series at the Autry Museum located on Tongva homelands in Los Angeles. This series brings together a variety of voices to discuss the legacies of historical people, places, and events, which are sometimes difficult and regrettable. We will leave it to others to put figures up on pedestals or take them down. Our question is how do we, today, choose to live with the history we have inherited and use it to move forward? Good evening, everybody. I feel so very lucky to be here tonight with my beloved friend and one of the great uh, scholars of women's suffrage working right now, Kathleen Cahill. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of an introduction for Kathleen, who to many of you, I hope, needs no introduction um, in the typical format that academics do these kinds of things. Um, she received her PhD at the University of Chicago, and for 13 years, she was my colleague at the University of New Mexico, and we felt a little bit like the Boston fans must have felt when Babe Ruth went to the Yankees uh, when she moved to Penn State, where she's now Associate Professor of history. Uh, she's author most recently of Recasting the Boat, How Women of Color Transformed the Suffrage Movement, published by the University of North Carolina Press in 2020. This is my copy, um, which I uh, ordered as soon as it was available from the University of North Carolina Press. And I'm simply awaiting Kathleen's return to, do, to Albuquerque, um, hopefully very soon so she can sign it for me. Her first book, Federal Fathers and Mothers, A Social History of the United States Indian Service, 1869 to 1933, was also published by University of North Carolina Press in 2011. And it was the winner of the Labriola Center for American Indian National Book Award and a finalist for the prestigious David J. Weber and Bill Clements Book Prize. This year, she co-edited a special suffrage issue for the Journal of the Gilded, Gilded Age and Progressive Year with Kimberly Hamlin and Crystal Deemster. She was also, I should say, co-program chair of the Berkshire Conference um, on Women's History, and she is steering committee chair for the Coalition for Western Women's History. So um, we'll give a big virtual Autry welcome to Kathleen Cahill. It's wonderful to see you tonight. Thank you so much, Ginge. I, it is delightful to be here. I wish I were um, with you and I wish we were at the Autry, but uh, I'm grateful that we can, can do this through Zoom. And so uh, thank you for that introduction. So um, your book is absolutely um, exciting and revolutionary. And for me, as somebody who's studied the women's suffrage movement, particularly in the West, um, for longer than I would care to admit right now, um, <laughs> longer than our hair has become in the pandemic. <laughs> um, I, you know, I wanna, I wanna ask you, I, this is a book that completely made me rethink how I think about the women's suffrage movement. And, and what you look at is the ways in which women of color transform the suffrage movement. And there's been a lot of work that's come out this year, very exciting work about women of color as uh, advocates of women's rights in general and women's voting rights in particular. But I'd like to ask you, um, first of all, how did you choose the women that you wrote about? So um, one thing I would say is, as I was teaching in New Mexico, there were people like Nina Otero Warren, who's one of the women I write about in the book, um, who are very well known in New Mexico, right? There are historical markers, there are murals, um, you know, people know her story as a suffragist, but it's really, that story wasn't known outside of New Mexico. Um, and so, right, just by being there and learning her history in the state, that's why I chose her. But the, the story really got started when I was writing my first book. One of the native women that I was writing about who was an Indian service employee is Marie Louise Botno Baldwin, who's a Turtle Mountain Chippewa woman um, from what is now North Dakota, who uh, moved to Washington DC with her father. They were advocates for tribal sovereignty and kind of contesting a treaty, but she ends up working in the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And then she ends up um, going to law school at a feminist law school in DC and um, becomes involved in the suffrage movement and marches in the 1913 suffrage parade. I don't really talk about that in the first book, but I knew about it. And um, you know, it was a classic Phil Deloria question. 
here was an Indian in an unexpected place, right? The, the 1913 suffrage parade is really famous and I had no idea there was a native woman in it. So I thought, well, I'll write something about her <laughs> for the anniversary. And then it kind of exploded into, into the book. And so um, I had initially thought I would use that parade. There were many African-American women in it. Um, there's at least one Chinese woman and then um, uh, Marie Baldwin. But um, as I was doing the research, I kind of came across other women whose stories were just so compelling. Um, and again, Nina Otero Warren was someone I wanted to include. So it, it expanded a little bit. So I also talk about a woman named Mabel Penghua Lee, um, who's a Chinese woman who cannot become a US citizen, but essentially lives here most of her life. And two other native women, Laura Cornelius Kellogg, who's a Wisconsin Oneida, and Gertrude Bonin or Zit Kalasa, who is um, Yangtan, Dakota. And, and Carrie Williams Clifford, who's an African-American woman who is in that 1913 parade. So this is a, you know, this is a book about women of color. Um, you're, you know, covering a number of different ethnic groups, but how were, you know, I, it's interesting to me because Mabel Pinghua Lee can't become a suffragist, uh, can't become a citizen. She certainly can become a suffragist. Um, her story is a transnational story. These other women have stories that relate to different um, agendas that they have that are based not only on their gender, but also on their race. And so I'd like you to, to help us understand a little bit the ways in which understanding their diverse agendas makes us see the woman suffrage movement in a way that we hadn't seen it before. So one of the things that I really want people to take away after reading the book is that despite the title saying how women of color transformed the suffrage movement, that's not a unified group. They are unified in that they share some things. Um, they share uh, the experience of being discriminated against, um, of being disenfranchised, and facing a lot of prejudice in uh, the United States. But they all come to advocate for suffrage from reasons that really grow out of their own experiences and their own community's experiences. Um, so as I tell their stories, I try to sort of show where they're overlapping, but where they're not. And I think this really does um, force us to think differently about the suffrage story, because it isn't a single story. And I'll say that um, scholars of African American history, right, I'm really uh, grateful to a number of scholars who had been writing about Black women um, and, and making the, the point that they are suffragists, um, but they're coming out of different traditions. I wanted to start thinking about um, sort of other women from other groups and how questions about citizenship, race and eth ethnicity, and, and region really matter when we start thinking about, you know, the multiple suffrage stories that go into making up the suffrage movement. One thing I really want to think with tonight is the fact that three of the women that whose stories you follow here are Native women. And um, the Autry has the second largest collection of Native materials in the United States after the Smithsonian. We are in a place now where we understand the ways in which the Native experience frames the American experience and that, you know, Native history is American history and American history is a subset in many ways of Native history. So could you talk a little bit about why you have um, such a great representation of Native women and, and how their stories really shape your larger story? Well, I like your emphasis on, um, right, the importance of Native history and all three of the women I write about 100% would have shared that opinion. They all write history to a certain extent, um, all three of them. Um, to answer your question, I think partly, you know, I came to this project um, as someone who had written about Native women. Um, and so it was kind of aware of uh, the real richness of that history. It, you know, we sort of often hear, oh, there's not sources. It's too hard to write. I think maybe that's a slightly older narrative, but but I knew that there were lots of things out there. Um, I had encountered two of the women in the first book, Gertrude Bonin and Marie Baldwin, but uh, you know people didn't really talk about them as suffragists. People have written some incredible work about Gertrude Bonin's um, activism in a variety of ways, right? She's a famous author who writes um, stories that are quite critical of federal Indian policy. She's in the Society of American Indians. Um, actually, all three of the women are. And people have written quite a bit about her decades-long activism, but rarely about her as a suffragist. Um, 
And I had actually initially thought, well, I'm not going to write about her. We know so much about her. But it turned out we, we didn't really know as much about those moments where she's advocating for the right to vote, where she's engaging with white suffragists um, in some pretty major moments. Can and you then, just give said, us an example of, you know, one of those sure. moments? Sure. Um, so, I mean, the this might be jumping the gun on your questions, but um, one of the things about Native women is 1920 doesn't necessarily, the, the 19th Amendment in 1920 doesn't necessarily enfranchise Native women um, because they are uh, legal wards of the government. They aren't U.S. citizens, many of them. Um, in 1921, about six months after ratification, Alice Paul holds this huge conference um, in Washington of the National Women's Party, Alice Paul, and says, what are we going to do next, right? We have the vote and we have this amazing machinery, right? The National Women's Party had a branch in every state. They were incredibly organized. They knew how to lobby. So what were they going to do? And she invites women um, from like every progressive era um, organization you can think of to come kind of pitch to her. And um, Gertrude Bonin's one of those women. And she gets on the stage and she says, the fight isn't over, right? Native women and, and Native men don't have the right to vote. And um, so she asks those women to, to keep fighting for the enfranchisement of all women. And I should add, Black women do too, um, but they don't get an invitation. Gertrude Bonin gets an invitation. Um, and she- So why, why don't the Black women get an invitation? The Black women who've been so active in the movement, Martha Jones writes about them in her book, Vanguard, you know, why are they not getting an invitation, but this Native woman activist does? So that's right, one of the big sort of things I had to grapple with in this book, which is that um, Black women are treated really differently from the other women of color that I write about by white suffragists. And I think it comes back to that, that sense of what's similar and what's different. And one thing that's different is there's pervasive anti-Blackness. Um, just it's really deep, it's really entrenched. A lot of the prejudice that the other women faced was really awful, right? I don't wanna downplay it, but um, there were ways in which it was all, they were also all romanticized, right? Native women were romanticized in very particular ways, especially back East. Chinese women were really romanticized, but also kind of thought of as foreign. So we can talk more about that. And the Spanish speaking women like Nina Otero Warren were really kind of positioning themselves as European, right? They were Spanish. They weren't yeah. Mexican or Mexican American. So they were able to kind of navigate some of those racial ideas and kind of leverage them in a way that Black women couldn't. Um, white suffragists were really worried that Black women's um, visibility meant that white Southern politicians wouldn't support the movement because it would bring attention, bring the nation's attention to the fact that Black men were disenfranchised in the South and the 15th Amendment was being ignored. So any kind of conversation about voting rights um, for African-American women uh, Southerners did not want to deal with that. And a lot of the white suffrage leaders were willing to capitulate to that. So thinking about the ways in which the Chinese woman suffragist, uh, Hispana from New Mexico, and the Native women that you write about were able to navigate and, and in some ways manipulate mm -hmm. um, the kind of stereotypes that they had. Were there moments where you see them being particularly effective in pleading their case, both with the wider group, you know, the white women suffragists, and I say wider because some of them, like Nina Otero Warren, are, you know, making their case for their white whiteness, right? Mm -hmm. Whiteness is never this thing that is, you know, unproblematic. Um, it's always a problem. But um, where do you see them being most effective and, um, and where did it lead for them? So I think it's pretty effective for someone like Nino Tara Warren, um, but her families, both on her mother's side and her father's side, are really powerful um, political families in New Mexico. And, you know, she becomes Alice Paul's point person in New Mexico, right? She is the head of the National Women's Party in New Mexico. You know, so she's a Santa Fe socialite who is really close to powerful men. Um, and is able, able to use those connections. She's in the capital city um, with kind of the social networks that go along with that. And so she's, she's quite politically able to, to use those positions to insist on a bilingual suffrage movement, right? Which is what one of her big goals. 
um, and protect the Spanish language and kind of um, nurture it. Um, Gertrude Bonin is another person, and, and actually all the Native women are, are quite adept at understanding what white Americans, and to a certain extent African Americans, but white Americans in particular, think of when they think of Indians, and it's people in buckskin with braids and feathers and beads. Um, and they're all willing at times to, um, you know, wear dresses like that or wear their hair in that particular way in order to get invited to give speeches. Bonin calls her dress her calling card. She knows that this particular buckskin dress gets her in the door and on the stage. And once she's on the stage, she has the audience, right? Yeah, I, I, and and you told me actually um, when we were we were talking about doing this program, you told me that um, she she insisted on one booking that that somebody else would have to carry the dress, right? Because it was yeah. too heavy to to schlep on the train or whatever. It's got you know? this amazing just um, beaded front. I don't know if it's dentelia shells or something. I can't quite tell, but. Um, and yeah, it, so the letter I found from a little bit later, I think like 19, late twenties, she writes to someone who clearly asked her to wear it. And she says, you know, I, I've stopped wearing it because it's so heavy and I, you have to basically have someone come pick it up for me on the train or I'm not wearing it. Um, it's so interesting to contemplate that too, on the very day when Secretary of the Interior, Deborah Halland was sworn in wearing a absolutely divine ribbon dress um, that, you know, and with her entire family in attendance, similarly in regalia, and knowing that, you know, yes, she also is a very savvy um, uh, in her deployment of these images of herself as a fierce native woman, because this gives her a kind of standing. I think she understands that um, that she can use it as she pursues the political, very broad, very broad political agenda that she has um, as as Secretary of Interior. Now that she's not my Congresswoman anymore, which we feel very uh -huh. sad about, but you know, happy to see her her rise. She's been amazing and she does it a lot. She was wearing um, a similar skirt um, at the inauguration. She wore it for her swearing in as Congresswoman, right? So she, she does that really deliberately. And I think it's, um, you know, it's a very similar motivation to these women from a hundred years ago. Um, and one thing that I know with Marie Baldwin, she really wanted to celebrate native women's traditional sort of art forms. Um, she actually is a huge collector herself of um, Native women's art. She wears things that that highlight that and she talks about that. And we have to remember, right, this is the moment, um, 18, you know, 19, early turn of the century, um, when the federal government is really trying to stamp that out, right? Assimilation right. policy, the Carlisle Indian School, um, these are all places where, you know, traditional culture was being um, quashed. And so for these women to also, you know, show up in, in these, this clothing, it's an assertion of the value of their culture and particularly women's skills. So you mentioned the Carlisle Indian School and it always gets me thinking about, you know, people from further West getting shipped East to assimilate them into white culture and, and, and try to stamp out Native culture, but um, it got me thinking a lot about the fact that, you know, any number of these women were women who were Westerners, who made their mark in the suffrage movement in the East. Um, and in order to have the kind of national political influence they had, they had to live in New York or in Boston or in Washington. And you yourself are a Westerner. Uh, you live not far from the Colorado Indian School. And um, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the ways in which you being a Westerner influenced the way you wrote this book. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I am a Western historian and I think about this book and I think, is it a Western history? And to me it is, but a lot of the action takes place back East um, and in particularly in DC. It's not surprising that um, you know, a huge amount of suffrage activism happens there, but also that Native people are in the capital all the time mm -hmm. um, because of that nation to nation relationship. Um, so these women are, are there testifying before Congress, all members of the Society of American Indians whose headquarters is in DC, right across the street from the Bureau of Indian Affairs, right? So they're watching them. Um, 
you know, and you know, they come through for a whole variety of reasons. And they're going to places like Carlisle and visiting um, and then back out to the West or Midwest. So a lot of the action happens there, but the concerns I think are coming out of the West. And for me, you know, yes, I'm, so I'm from Northern California. I grew up near the Hoopa and Yurok reservations. Those are the two largest reservations in California, both size-wise and Yurok um, nation is the largest nation native nation in California population wise. You know, I grew up in a place where native people were really visible. We played basketball up the Hoopa reservation. Like, you know, it just, it was there. Um, and native people were part of my, my world, my modern world. I went to school at UC Davis. It's an extremely diverse campus, right? Um, and so for me, when I was hearing stories about suffrage or really often US history more broadly, um, that kind of diversity that I was used to wasn't always in the picture. And as a Western historian, I knew that there were all of these incredible women, your work on um, suffragists in Wyoming, right? Uh, Dina Gonzalez's work on women in New Mexico, Maria Montoya, um, uh, you know, Judy Young's work on, she talked about Chinese suffragists in California. So I knew like these stories were out there and I could draw on kind of that work and really build on it um, to understand what I was seeing um, in the sources. So um, speaking of diversity, I, I, I mean, we know that nobody is only one thing and we can't necessarily guarantee that uh, Native women, for example, will be in agreement on uh, any issue, including women's rights. Um, in my state, for example, in New Mexico, we have now, we did have two Congresswomen of Native descent. Uh, we now have one, Yvette Harold, who's a, a Harold, who is from the Southern District, uh, very much an advocate for the oil and gas industry, somebody who is extremely politically conservative, and so, you know, I'd ask you to, you know, to talk a little bit about, you know, other kinds of diversity among people who might seem to share the same identity, but that doesn't mean that we can guarantee that we'll know how they'll vote on one issue or another. No, absolutely not. I mean, um, you know, the, the party politics are all over the map in, in my book. Um, you know, some of these women are Democrats, some are Republicans, um, some get involved with like the progressive party. And, and so, you know, sometimes it's family connections. Sometimes it's who do they think um, best represents their, their issues. So Nina Otero Warren is a Republican because that is what her family is. And they're deeply, deeply connected to the Republican party. She does later <laughs> get a job in FDR's New Deal and becomes a Democrat, but that's part of the changing, you know, landscape of the 20th century. Gertrude Bonin um, in the election of 1928, so Native women are enfranchised by the Indian Citizenship Act of 1924, when the U.S. kind of blanket grants U.S. citizenship, and that's another place you see real differences. Um, not all Native people wanted U.S. citizenship. Um, in New Mexico, a lot of the Pueblo nations didn't want it because um, they were afraid that it, it would um, mean that they were giving up their sovereignty, right? And the three women I write about actually um, do a lot of work to try to theorize what, what I see, see as a dual, kind of a dual um, citizenship. Um, I use Shanina Lomoima's idea of uh, layered citizenship, but right, they were really trying to work through how, how they could be both. Um, but not all, not everybody agreed with them, not all Native people. In 1928, when Charles Curtis is running on the Hoover ticket as a, the vice presidential candidate, he's um, a man of Ka descent. He used to say, I am one eighth Ka and 100% a Republican. And uh, she writes to both he and um, or the Hoover campaign and the Smith campaign, Al Smith, and basically says, what's your Indian policy, right? What are you gonna do? I'll support you if you convince me. And Hoover doesn't respond to her um, and Smith does. And actually John Collier writes this whole thing. Um, and so she ultimately endorses Smith uh, even though there was a native man running on the Republican ticket. So it's a, much like today, right? It, it's extremely complicated and it has to do with a lot of different complex, um, you know, they're making complex decisions based on a lot of things that they're weighing. Yeah, I mean, I would say even from the point of view of 
you know, white women in a place like Wyoming, uh, a lifelong suffragist like Grace Raymond Hebert, who was a lifelong Republican when it came time for Nellie Taylor Ross, who had um, become the first woman governor in the United States, uh, who was a Democrat when she ran for reelection after her husband had died and she'd replaced him in a special election. Uh, Grace Hebert went public saying, you know, hey, we're not going to vote for a woman just because she's a woman. This woman is a Democrat. <laughs> and so she was, you know, in a way, she had celebrated the ascension of Ross to the governorship, but at the same time, you know, not sure that she wanted to endorse the kind of um, politics and policies that that a Democrat would bring into the governorship. And in fact, uh, Ross lost that election and, and mm -hmm. went off to Washington, where she served in the Roosevelt administration, Democratic Party um, committee woman, and eventually was for years and years and years director of the Mint. So um, it's interesting to think about the ways in which these women's careers in the West do lead them East mm -hmm. eventually. Um, so uh, going from a kind of geographical sweep um, toward maybe a, a, a sweep across time a little bit, because uh, we live in a time when um, in some way it's a legacy of the legacies of the women that you write about are on the one hand being realized because we have more women of color in positions of, of power and authority than we ever have before, both at the local and state and national level. Uh, but also that um, the gains are always and perpetually fragile and contested. Mm -hmm. um, so let's let's think a minute um, about the legacies um, of of these women. You know, how do you see people like Gertrude Bonin and uh, people like Ma Mabel Ping Ha Lee? Um, how do you see their legacies being realized in 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 women leaders of today? Um, I mean. Kamala Harris, a Western woman, right, um, as vice president, um, drawing strongly from the African-American political tradition, but also, right, always emphasizing that her mom, um, right, as an Indian woman and an immigrant, um, that that shapes her politics as well. Um, so, you know, a lot of these women um, were somewhat frustrated I think um, after 1920 or even after 1924 in the case of native women, um, Mabel Pinhali couldn't ever vote as far as I know she never does vote because again, the Chinese Exclusion Act said immigrants from China cannot become naturalized citizens. Um, and she had immigrated um, when she was about five. Nino Tara Warren initially, right? She, the Republican party puts her up for um, congressional representative in 1922. And she's one of the first women to run for office after um, the ratification, but she loses. She continues to do work. She's a superintendent of Santa Fe schools. She gets appointed to a superintendent of Indian schools in New Mexico. And then later, as I said, is appointed to work in Puerto Rico um, during the New Deal. So she, she kind of continues to have a political career, but not in elected office. And Native women watch after 1928 right? A, a Native man is vice president. It seems like this really incredible moment, but it's also a moment when Western states are moving quickly to disenfranchise Native people. And they're using a lot of Jim Crow techniques, you know, poll taxes, literacy tests. Um, they're also using um, the relationship of the federal government and Native people. So in New Mexico, as you know, and Arizona, um, the state courts rule that if, if you live on a reservation as a native person, you can't vote. You're still considered a ward of the government. Um, and all of the women, except for Marie, uh, two, Marie Baldwin and Mabel Pinhua Lee, um, both pass away in the 50s and 60s. The rest of them pass away in the 30s. Um, and so, you know, they themselves don't necessarily see these things realized. But I absolutely think that both their stories are important and can um, inspire us today. And they show that, that women from these communities were absolutely involved in this uh, fight and in advocating for their communities and for the right to vote. Um, but they also, right, I mean, they, they set some of the templates. I'm quite convinced that um, Bonin and Kellogg and Baldwin are influencing John Collier. Um, and, you know, he goes on to become FDR's um, 
uh, commissioner of Indian Affairs and, and starts the Indian New Deal. And there are a lot of their ideas about um, tribal governments and kind of more of a dual citizenship um, protection of native traditions. And, you know, we can talk about Collier further and, and talk about what was good and what was bad, but um, I see some of their legacy there as well. I think both in who they are and how they, um, they matter today and thinking about this long history, but also that some of their ideas really got into the suffrage movement, really get into some of the other political movements that they're involved in. Carrie Williams Clifford helps found Washington's NAACP and the Ohio Federation of Women's Clubs. Both of those groups continue to exist today. So um, their legacies are there and uh, I think are really valuable. So I think as our audience can tell from the kinds of things you've just been saying about what kind of power they exercised and, and uh, what kind of uh, things they advocated, um, that these are pretty elite women. And so we have a question from Gabriela Gonzalez. Hi, hi Gabriela. Um, she wants to know what role does class status and other forms of privilege play in inspiring and facilitating the activism of these women? Yeah, these absolutely. These women are all, um, you know, in their communities, pretty elite. They all have um, pretty high levels of education, right? In the in the Western tradition, Mabel Lee um, goes to Barnard College, where she does a lot of her suffrage activism, and then she actually gets a PhD in economics at Columbia in 1921. Uh, Gertrude Bonin graduated from Earlham College. Um, the other women had all had some college classes. Um, I think Nino Otero Warren is the, she had, a, she went to a kind of a seminary in St. Louis. Um, so they're all, yes, from, e they're, so they're all highly educated, which helps. Um, and they, many of them are from um, politically connected families. And they're all definitely, again, elites in their societies or communities that they probably had less um, fiscal kind of privilege than a lot, many of the white women that they're working with, but certainly in their communities that helped. Um, and, you know, that's absolutely true. And that does in some ways um, manifest itself in their work. You know, Tara Warren has a very kind of um, patrician attitude toward a lot of the poor Spanish speaking women in, in the state of New Mexico. She wants to help them, um, you know, and she wants to pass kind of laws uh, that will help women and children, kind of health care um, law. She, she runs on an anti-child labor plank, um, but she also, it's, it's sort of this lady bountiful kind of um, sense. So that does matter. And they are definitely, um, and many of them are kind of aware of that too, and do see, see it as their duty um, to do that. And again, the Native women, um, and their ability to, to be in DC in particular, right? Reservations are, people are very poor on the reservations um, at this time. And so they, they have, all three of them start out working for the Bureau of Indian Affairs um, and then become authors and speakers and are making their money kind of on the lecture circuit often. Um, so they do have a little bit more uh, privilege and are able to travel and able to kind of be involved in this, um, in these movements. That's, and that's I think, you know, it, it's interesting to reflect on the difference between their time and our own when the women leaders that we see emerging at this point, and this would include people like Deb Halland, mm -hmm. uh, you know, who, who was a single mother who didn't go to college until she was in her 20s, who, you know, raising her kid and had been a, a military brat and really, you know, had lived, pay, as she's constantly saying, lives paycheck, has experienced a life of paycheck to paycheck, or somebody like Corey. Bush, you know, the congresswoman from St. Louis, from my hometown, who's somebody who came up through the Black Lives Matter movement, or, you know, many, many women who've been active in, in working class um, organizations, in unions, who've made their, their bones and, and, and seen their political careers um, be a kind of outcome of their community activism. So I think, you know, there's really now a kind of broader base for women's activism uh, at a time when we see that the kind of gains that these women fought for, that the women in recasting the vote fought for, are fragile. Our freedoms are fragile. They are always contested. We see the right to vote right now being under attack. 
-hmm. all over the country. So, uh, you know, what I want to do before we get to um, seeing what other questions are out there, and thank you, Gabriela, for that great question. Um, you know, what's happening now, Kathleen? Mm -hmm. um, uh, what are the lessons of recasting the vote for those of us who want to protect voting rights right now? Yeah, I mean, it's that, that voting rights are fragile, um, that they are, um, they're really powerful though, right? That's why people uh, try so hard to keep people from getting them, right? These women were fighting for many, many years. It was recognized at the time that this could give women and communities of color power. Um, when, when Native people get the Citizenship Act, when it, in, it, it bestows citizenship and then they are able to vote, newspaper articles across the country um, are all asking, you know, what is this Indian vote going to mean? And Gertrude Bonin says, like, we have population in certain states that if we kind of work together and vote, we can make a difference. Um, and, you know, I, I see precisely that in a lot of these efforts to disenfranchise um, people to make voting harder because people in power don't want people to vote because it gives you power. And I think it's no, um, you know, it's, it's really not until the 1965 Voting Rights Act and then its subsequent amendments that things like language rights, um, you know, requiring ballots in, in other languages, um, the pre-clearance clauses that we think of as applying to the former Confederate states, they actually applied all across the West as well in places that had disenfranchised, um, you know, if a certain percentage of voters had been disenfranchised based on their identity, pre-clearance counted, Arizona. Um, Alaska, South Dakota had preclearance, um, and the Shelby v. Holder case of 2013 that got rid of preclearance, right, I think that's really opened up um, and created an opportunity for these disenfranchisement efforts that are, are trying to undermine everything that these women work for, right? It seems like 100 years ago is a long time ago, but it, again, it, they didn't actually, those communities didn't win the right to vote until about, what, 50, 60 years ago. So I tend, you know, people tend to think that the right to vote is, is affirmatively uh, determined in the Constitution or given to us by affirmation when in fact, what the Constitution and the amendments to the Constitution say is, you can't prevent somebody from voting on the basis of X of sex or of race. Um, and, and of course, you know, what that means is you can prevent them from voting on, a, you know, according to lots of other different kinds of things, like uh, whether they stood in line long enough or whether you can give them a bathroom break or whether you can give them something to drink. And so we see all these different, you know, whether they can only vote on Sunday because they're working. Um, so all of these things, in fact, have been contested from the very beginning in 1869 in Wyoming, um, when, uh, when William Bright, who was a territorial legislator, um, a Democrat, introduced the first woman suffrage bill in American history. Um, he was asked outright, there was an amendment actually introduced by one of the opponents of the bill um, to say that, you know, Native women and other women of, and, and African American women with their rights also should be guaranteed by this. And that amendment was defeated because it was understood by all the men who voted to pass that law, it should only be white women. And so that tells you that this is not a new issue. This is a struggle that has gone on and on and on. And certainly, um, you know, we now understand the ways in which people of color um, are having to defend their rights uh, every day um, and, and their very lives. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanna thank you. I, I think, is it, if it's okay with you, let's go to some questions. Sure. Sure. Okay, so we have a question. Um, from um, Margaret O'Rourke, um, who would like to know a little bit more about Mabel Lee, um, where'd she come from and what did she do to promote the enfranchisement of all women? Um, and then we'll get to one more question that we have here too. Thank you, yeah, I love talking Thank about all of coming. them. So I'm, I'm happy to tell you more about Mabel Lee. So um, she, as I said, comes when she's about five years old, she immigrates with her mother, who's a teacher. And so the Chinese Exclusion Act gave a very small number of um, exceptions to basically a no immigration from China rule. And um, her mother had worked um, as a teacher at a mission station, the Graves Mission Station in Canton. And actually a lot of the Chinese immigrants in the US are from Canton. Um, and they were coming to the United States to meet her father who um, had also been at that mission station 
and come and was working in Baptist missions um, for the Chinese communities on the West Coast. And then they eventually get um, stationed in uh, New York City. And so um, he becomes a missionary at the, uh, what, at, at the Baptist mission in Chinatown. And so she grows up um, in New York and she and her mother are, are quite involved in a lot of things. The YWCA, um, they raise funds for famine victims in China. They work through the church, right? Sunday school, stuff like this. And um, what's interesting then about her story is it goes back to China. In 1911, there's a revolution in China. It's not the, not the communist revolution, but um, a Republican revolution that overthrows the Qing empire. And the new republic, uh, the government that gets set up um, is in favor of women's rights um, and has talked about enfranchising women. Women had been involved in the revolution and American audiences have been kind of following all of this. And um, this, the story is that, that China has enfranchised women. They haven't fully, they left it to each province to decide, but some women were. And um, so suffrage leaders in the US are very interested in this and they ask a lot of women um, in Chinese communities across the country to speak on this. And it's the first time that Mabel kind of um, seems to, to, to be involved, but she speaks to a group of women, um, including Anna Howard Shaw, who is the president of the National American Women's Suffrage Association. And she really impresses them. They ask her to be in that 1912, um, famous 1912 New York City suffrage parade. They ask her to actually ride in the front of it, kind of this position of honor. And um, as I said, the next year she goes to Barnard and Barnard's a hotbed of suffrage activism. And so she's constantly engaged in those conversations, but she's also very engaged in conversations about what's happening in China and um, is talking especially to a student group called the Chinese Student Alliance um, of students in the United States who have, are exchange students from China who will be the political and economic elites when they return home. And she spends a lot of time talking to them um, and reminding them of why um, this new government needs to incorporate women's suffrage and women's equality. So she's working both um, for US suffrage for, for women in the United States, but also transnationally for suffrage in China. Um, so so let's talk a little bit about those political elites. And this gets to another question from Gabriela Gonzalez. Um, she's interested to know how white men in power understood the activism of women, women of color, and also wants to know whether men of color um, and with the kind of privilege that um, male leaders of color uh, exercised and enjoyed, uh, did they lend their support? So those are, yeah, those are two fantastic questions. Um, the first question is really interesting. I primarily see these, um, the women of color engaging with white women, with the suffrage leaders and in suffrage organizations, um, as opposed to male politicians, with the exception of Nina Otero Warren. So I'll come back to her. Um, so they're, they're primarily working in their own communities or engaging with suffragists. And um, within their own communities, it kind of varies. Um, so African-American women are basically appealing to African-American men, um, arguing like you're disenfranchised on the basis of race, we're disenfranchised on the basis of sex, like you should be supporting this. And they do get support from people like W.E.B. Du Bois, um, Mary Church Terrell's husband is the uh, first uh, black man appointed judge in DC. He's a big suffragist. Right, so there are definitely um, a number of prominent black men who support it. Um, in the Chinese community, um, you know, it, it, it varies. Mabel Lee's father is really supportive of her. He was very supportive of um, her getting an education, both a traditional Chinese education, which he, he seems to homeschool her, um, and a Western style education. Um, so as I said, Nina Otero Warren's the one big, um, the one place where I see uh, her engaging with white politicians um, because A.A. Uh, a. Jones is the Senator from New Mexico who is on the, um, he's the chair of the Committee on Women's Suffrage. <laughs> so uh, she's doing a lot of, um, you know, advocacy work with him um, in her position again as head of the National Women's Party because she's one of the, right, she's one of the few who was a leader in, um, 
you know, a mainstream white suffrage organization. But I do talk a little bit about men of color. Um, I mentioned Charles Curtis. He is a huge supporter of women's rights. Um, uh, he um, actually, he's in, he's in Congress forever. He's first a, a representative from Kansas, and then he's a senator from Kansas, and then he becomes vice president. And while he is, so Kansas, right, women are enfranchised in 1912. Um, so he's had women as constituents for many years. But he is the first senator to introduce the Equal Rights Amendment in the Senate in 1923. Um, and it's because he's had this long relationship with the National Women's Party. Um, I talk wow. about um, a number of other, um, you know, number of men from New Mexico, Spanish speaking men who support it. Not all of them do, but, but a number do. Um, I talk about, um, uh, there's one uh, Hawaii, I talk about Hawaii a little bit in the book. I haven't talked about it here. But uh, the Hawaiian delegate, um, so he's not a voting delegate, right? Because it's a territory, um, but he is supportive of women's suffrage. Um, and actually um, white suffragists kind of work with him um, during this lull as they're trying to move the 19th amendment forward to get um, uh, kind of a ruling from Congress that the territory of Hawaii can uh, vote on women's suffrage. So men of color are definitely, um, again, not, it's not uniform, but there are many who are supportive. Gertrude Bonin's husband's a huge um, supporter of her and her work. So um, I, I think especially in these women's families, uh, they had support from, from the men in their families. And I think, you know, as you, as you mentioned, people who are not really represent, I mean, they have uh, representation, but no, no voting rights. And we can think about uh, Representative Stacey Plaskett, who was a member of the, you know, the House impeachment managers um, from the Virgin oh, Islands. Yeah. Or we think about the, the District of Columbia right now, um, the territory of Puerto Rico. We're still, um, there's still a fight for representation mm -hmm. and still a fight for voting rights and still a lot of women whose stories remain to be told. Um, I want to, I want to thank everybody especially you, Kathleen Cahill, uh, for being here tonight to hear, um, hear some of the, uh, just a little bit about what you can learn if you go <laughs> to your local bookstore and insist they stock a copy of Recasting the Boat. Um, or if you want to buy it online, there are lots of places you can do that um, from the University of North Carolina Press and other places. Um, and I would like to remind people if they want to know more stories about women, you can go to the Autry website uh, for the What's Her Story exhibition, Autry exhibitions, What's Her Story, Women in the Archives. There's some great, you can come and when we get back open fully uh, and open the Autry Resource Center, that's a place where you'll be able to be able to do your own research on some of the women that uh, whose 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 materials are in our archives and some of some of those uh, who you might follow their trails, and so um, I just want to say thank you to all of you for being here tonight. It's just been a pleasure to be a part of this discussion. Uh, I hope to see you um, in the ether like this. I hope to see you out at the Autry when we get the museum open again. And thank you so much, Kathleen, for being here tonight. And thank you for those wonderful questions, Virginia. You really, that, that was such a great conversation. And thank you everyone else for the, the questions you all asked. This was great. Um, I really appreciate it. Great to be here tonight. Everybody stay well, stay safe, and we'll hope to see you soon. The Autry Museum of the American West thanks our members and supporters.